Threads are found on countless items in use by the people of the world every day. From the fasteners that hold our cars together, to the bottle caps that keep our soda from going flat. While there are many different thread forms, we'll concentrate on those that are most commonly used. First, we should discuss some terms that are used to describe threads. Let's take a look inside of this one. The crest is the peak of the thread. The root is the valley between the threads. The major diameter refers to the largest diameter of the thread. On external threads, it'll be the distance from crest to crest. On internal threads, it will be the distance from root to root. Likewise, the minor diameter is the smaller diameter of the thread. So on external threads, it will be the distance from root to root. And on internal threads, it will be the distance from crest to crest. The pitch diameter is an imaginary line running roughly from the middle of one thread to the middle of the opposite side. The pitch diameter is the sole determining factor of the class of fit of a thread, how tight or how loose it is. So that actually makes it the most important dimension on any thread. The pitch is the distance from a point on one thread to the corresponding point on the next thread. It's very simple to say from point to point, but it could easily be from root to root. The distance is going to be the same. The lead of a thread is the distance that it travels with one rotation of the screw. Imagine you're riding on the nut that's attached to this screw, and it made one revolution around, you would travel over a certain distance. On single start threads, this is the same as the pitch. On multiple start threads, it would be the pitch times the number of starts. The most common thread form in the entire world is based on an equilateral triangle, so the thread forms a 60 degree angle. The form is identical between both imperial and metric threads, and the same tooling can be used to cut both. As you can see on the drawing, there's a small flat at the top and the bottom of the thread, and this is to account for tool wear. If the threads were actually sharp, the tool would break down too quickly and the threads would not fit. There's actually an allowance for roundness at both the top and bottom of the thread as well to account for tool wear. Let's talk a little bit about thread designations for each type. Imperial threads are designated as unified national threads. A typical designation looks like quarter 20 UNC 2A. In this particular case, the quarter in the thread designation is the nominal major diameter, or quarter of an inch. 20 is the number of threads per inch, or TPI. Note that to find the pitch of a unified national thread, you need to divide 1 by the TPI. So in this case, 1 20th of an inch is 50 thousandths of pitch. This will be needed later to determine the proper tap drill size. UNC stands for Unified National Course. UNF would mean Unified National Fine. And then there's UNEC and EF for Extra Course and Extra Fine. And there's a slew of threads designated UNS for Unified National Special. Those would be anything that didn't fit into the other categories. Two shows the class of fit. There are three classes of fit, with one being the loosest. Those are for parts that require frequent assembly and disassembly. Class 2 is a middle-of-the-road fit, typically used for your average, everyday nut and bolt. And Class 3 is the tightest fit, for parts that need to fit precisely, such as the thimble screws on micrometers. Again, pitch diameter is the only thing that determines the class of fit of a thread. A in the designation notes that it's an external thread, such as a bolt or a screw. B would mean that it's an internal thread, a nut. A typical metric thread designation would look like M6 by 1.0. M6 in this case is the major diameter, which for this thread will be 6 millimeters, and 1.0 is the pitch of the thread, 1 millimeter from point to point in this case. On many prints, the thread might be called out simply as M6 with the assumption that it would be the coarse thread for that size. The pitch would then be specified if it was for something other than the coarse pitch. Tolerances for metric threads are more complicated than simply having three classes of fit. The tolerances are designated with an alphanumeric code that shows the allowable deviation from the exact size of the thread, as shown in this chart. 
External threads are designated with lowercase letters and internal threads with capital letters. Smaller numbers signify a tighter tolerance for both internal and external threads. Threads are often called out with two codes. To bring back our M6 example, it might be stated as M6 by 1.0-5G 6G. The first code would be the tolerance for the pitch diameter and the second would be for the major diameter. If the two values are identical, for example 6G 6G, they would simply be called out as 6G. Threads with no tolerance designation called out can be assumed to be 6G for bolts and 6H for nuts. The actual measurements for each of these bands depends on the pitch of the thread and will need to be looked up in Machinery's Handbook or a similar resource. Pipe threads use the same 60 degree thread profile as both inch and metric threads, but their size is based on the inside diameter of the pipe, not the major diameter of the thread. For example, half inch pipe is half inch in diameter on the inside of the pipe, but nearly 7 eighths in diameter on the outside. Of course, the size here is a little strange as well because nominally this is inch and a quarter pipe, but it's actually 1.4 inches on the inside. Further, there are tapered pipe threads for self-sealing applications like gas and water pipe, and straight pipe threads for things like electrical fittings. On prints, pipe threads will be called out with the diameter and whether it's tapered or straight, for instance, half inch NPT for national pipe tapered, or 8th inch NPS for national pipe straight. I have to say, these are the cleanest pipe threads I've ever seen on a pipe nipple from the store. They normally look like they were chewed in by rabid squirrels, so this must have been fresh squirrel day at the factory. The Acme thread is very common, especially in power transmission applications such as lead screws for machine tools and valve stems. The angle formed by the thread is 29 degrees and there's a large flat at the crest and root of the thread. This produces a thick thread that's very strong yet still moves easily. The thread designation is similar to that of the Unified National Threads. For instance, half inch 10 Acme on a print would mean half inch major diameter with 10 TPI and Acme alerting the machinist to the different thread form. The trapezoidal thread is the metric equivalent of the Acme, and the two threads are very similar in appearance, although the angle formed by the trapezoidal thread is 30 degrees instead. A typical thread designation would be TR12 by 3, meaning a trapezoidal thread with a 12 mm major diameter and 3 mm pitch. The drawing here is overly simplified. It shows the, the major proportions of the thread, but there's actually quite a lot of math involved in figuring out the width of those flats. Uh, so each one is different depending on the threads per inch, and that's something you should be aware of. Square threads offer a very strong thread that has minimal friction. However, they are very difficult to cut due to the square shape. They've largely been supplanted by the Acme thread, but can still be found in use for valve stems and on heavy-duty clamps. Buttress threads are asymmetrical in shape, usually with a 45 degree angle on one side of the thread and anywhere between 0 and 7 degrees on the other. There are a lot of variations on this shape around the world, but they all offer a lot of strength and holding power in one direction, but release easily when loosened. I can guarantee that almost every person watching this video has used a buttress thread at some point today. They're used extensively in plastic bottling, especially for carbonated beverages, and also the adjusting screw on crescent wrenches is a buttress thread. Threads are described as being right or left-handed depending on the direction in which they tighten. I'm sure everyone's heard the righty-tighty, lefty-loosey adage. That applies to right-handed threads, but it would actually be opposite for left-handed ones. Right-handed threads are far more common, however, there are some very notable examples of left-handed threads. The fuel lines on oxyacetylene torches are made left-handed to avoid accidentally swapping the fuel and oxygen lines, which could cause an explosion. One of the pedals on your bicycle has left-handed threads, so it won't unscrew while you use it. And then also one end on the shaft of bench grinders is left-handed for the same reason, so your nut doesn't come off and throw your grinding wheel right into your face. On prints, a thread designation that ends in LH 
denotes a left-handed thread. If there's nothing there, you can assume that it's right-handed. Most threads only have one start, meaning that there is only one thread that spirals around the rod of the screw. However, screws can also have multiple starts, with several threads offset from and intertwining around each other. The advantage of this is that transmitted motion is faster because each thread travels farther in one rotation. Remember earlier when I mentioned lead and pitch? Lead is the distance the thread travels with one rotation, and if you have multiple starts, then your lead would be the pitch of the screw times the number of starts. This means that if you had a screw that looked like four threads per inch, so a quarter of an inch pitch, but with four starts, one rotation would make whatever it's driving travel one inch. The disadvantage of this is the lack of holding power. If the purpose of the thread is to hold two pieces together, use a single start thread. That's why most hardware is a single start. If it's a power transmission application and you want to move quickly, a multi-start thread might be what you need. Multi-start threads are also commonly used in the plastic bottling industry because it allows the bottler to rapidly cap their product, thereby increasing their production rates. Multi-start threads can be found using any thread form. This is a bottle of my favorite sports drink and it has a double start buttress thread. You can see one thread starting there and another starting 180 degrees away from the first one. Right there. This is a lemonade bottle with three starts, so each thread starts 120 degrees away from the previous one. This makes it very fast to cap a bottle, which means you can bottle more product and make more money. This milk jug has four starts. Each thread is 90 degrees apart. Again, this makes bottling the milk quite fast. You don't have to turn the cap very much, at least uh, you don't if you start it on straight. And the most I've ever seen on a jug is actually seven starts. And with that, you could actually push the thing straight on. You didn't even need to thread it at all, which made bottling very quick. Taps are the most common method of producing standard size internal threads, especially in smaller sizes where threading on the lathe or thread milling becomes impractical. Taps are generally available in four types. Hand taps are characterized by having straight flutes. The chips that are produced curl up inside the flute of the tap. These chips have to be broken off by turning the tap backward for every quarter of a turn forward. This makes them unsuitable for power tapping on a machine. Spiral point taps also have straight flutes, but they have the addition of an angled point at the tip. This point drives the chips forward, so there's no need to turn back to break the chip. Because the chips are driven forward, these taps are most suited to threading through holes, holes that go all the way through apart. You can use them for blind holes as well, you just need to make sure that you drill the hole slightly deeper to have room for the chips at the bottom. Spiral flute taps have flutes that spiral around the body of the tap. The chips are pulled out of the hole similar to the chips produced by a drill bit. This makes them very well suited for threading blind holes, holes that do not go all the way through apart. However, due to the spiral flutes, they're tougher to remove if they break in the hole. Forming taps don't actually cut a chip. Instead, they displace metal to form the thread. Because of this, they require a larger tap drill size than cutting taps. They're commonly used on softer, more ductile materials, as well as on precious metals to minimize the loss of material. I mentioned that thread forming taps need to have a larger tap drill size, and that is because they displace metal. Uh, the analogy I like to use is squeezing Play-Doh. If you squeeze Play-Doh in your hands, yes, you're making indentations with your fingers, but you're also getting Play-Doh squeezing out in between your fingers. And the same thing happens with the metal. If you use a thread forming tap with the standard tap drill sizes, you'll end up jamming the tap into the work and probably breaking it off. These types of taps all have various tapers at the beginning of the tap. These tapers are described by how many threads it takes to reach the full diameter of the tap. Any type of tap can have any of these tapers. The first is taper taps, and these have 7 to 10 threads before they reach the full diameter. 
This type requires the least amount of effort to cut the threads, but can't get threads near the bottom of a hole. The second type are plug taps. This is the most commonly available taper and has three to five threads before reaching the full diameter. If you were to take a trip over to your local hardware store or home center, the type of taps that you're going to find there are almost certainly going to be plug taps. The last type is called a bottoming tap. This type is used to get threads close to the bottom of a blind hole. It generally only takes one to two and a half threads to reach the full diameter of the tap. It can be difficult to start these taps straight because of the small taper, and they require more force to cut the threads. They're commonly used after a taper or plug tap has cut the bulk of the thread for these reasons. Taps require a hole to be drilled in the part first. To find the size of this hole, we can use one of two formulas. For cutting taps, which are hand taps, spiral point taps, spiral flute taps, use the formula major diameter minus pitch and that will give you your tap drill size. For forming taps, ones that don't make a chip, use the formula major diameter minus pitch divided by two to get your tap drill size. Remember that on inch threads, you have to convert the TPI, the threads per inch, into pitch by using the formula 1 divided by TPI. Also remember that forming taps require a larger tap drill size because they displace metal instead of cutting it, and that's why we divide the pitch by 2. Both of these formulas will result in approximately 75% thread depth and work for both inch and metric threads. Some of you may be wondering about the 75% thread depth. The 75% that's there is the thickest part of the thread and therefore the strongest. That last 25% is just the tip that uh, doesn't add much to the strength, but it does add a lot to the necessary torque to cut that thread, which makes it more likely to break a tap. On tougher to machine materials, you may want to aim closer to 50% thread depth since it'll require a lot less torque to cut the threads and therefore lessen the chance of breaking your tap. In that case, use the formula major diameter minus pitch times 0.66 to get your tap drill size. We use 0.66 because with the other formula, major diameter minus pitch, we're getting 75% thread. So if we take two-thirds of that, then that will give us 50% thread. Some of you may be asking, why do we need these when we can find them on a chart someplace? And yes, you can find charts that have all of these on there for cutting taps, forming taps, and to get 50% thread depth. But this also works quite well for oddball threads that you're not going to find on a chart. If you had to cut, for instance, one and a half inch 20 or M40 by 1. Those are sizes that you're not necessarily going to find a chart for, and of course you're not going to have a tap for them either, but this works equally well for those oddball sizes to find the size of the hole you need before you single point thread it or thread mill it. Dies come in two varieties, hex and round. The hex type is commonly available, but it's really only meant for repairing damaged threads, not cutting them from round stock. So if you have threads that are rusty or dinged up, you could use this. Sometimes it's called a thread chaser for that reason. The round dies are meant for threading from solid stock, and they're split so they can be adjusted for different classes of fit and for wear. You can see there's an adjusting screw right there. In general, dies are difficult to start straight and tend to cut drunk threads. This means the die starts at a bit of an angle and it will cut at that angle and you'll end up with very thick threads on one side and practically non-existent threads on the other. If concentricity of the threads to the rest of the part is important, it's really best to cut the threads on the lathe. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button down below. If you have any questions and comments, leave those below as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.